Hi everybody, welcome to the Top 2 Inches of Sport podcast with me, Anthony Sheriff. This is a podcast about something that's always fascinated me, the mindset required to succeed in elite level sport. On this podcast, I'm going to talk to people who I really look up to in the world of sport and try to find out how they deal with the highs and lows that come with consistently striving for success in the unforgiven environment of elite sport. For the first podcast of the new year, I spoke to champion jockey Davy Russell. Davy's had huge success in his career, winning two Grand Nationals, the Cheltenham Gold Cup and plenty more as well. In this episode, Davy discusses the mental side of life as a jockey. He talks about various topics such as the struggle of making weight, the level of commitment needed to be a top jockey and he also talked me through how he prepares in the week leading up to a big race as well as on race day itself. Davy's actually the first jockey I've had on the podcast so it's great to get a little bit of insight into what jockeys experience throughout their careers. So here's this week's episode of the Top 2 Inches of Sport with jockey Davy Russell. Hi Davy, thanks a million for coming on to the podcast. Um, I'm just going to talk to you about all these different you know, mental aspects of horse racing but before we get on to the mental side I'll just ask you a physical question because I know you, you had a bad injury there at the back end of last year so how are you, how are you physically? Yeah, very good. Uh, yeah, I'm making good progress now. Um, I suppose the, the hardest part is ahead of me. Um, all the scans and everything are good. And and uh, so I started back riding out and uh, getting into the swing of things. So it's going to take me a bit of time, but hopefully now we'll get there. Yeah. Have you any kind of dates earmarked for when you hope to be back at it? Uh, not so much. I just kind of have to go through as much training as I possibly can and go back and make sure the scans are right. And then I obviously I, I'm probably not the lightest... Um, Jockey in the wear room, so I have a bit to work on my weight and things. So uh, there's still a good, good bit ahead of me yet. So uh, I look, you'd be hopeful, hopeful before the end of February, early March, you'd be hoping. Anyway. Hopefully, anyway. Well, look, we'll talk about different moments throughout your career, but usually when I get people on, I just kind of want to get a bit of a background of where they started. So at what age would you have, you know, basically been introduced to horses at? And were you always, was the dream always to be a jockey? Yeah, uh, well, I was always I was reared around horses. Um, you know, they were always around the farm and things like that. But uh, I suppose I, I got a pony um, kind of when I was about maybe ten or twelve, or maybe ten, nine or ten, and uh, kind of went on from there. And we sold that pony, went on to a new pony, and uh, that was an, that was probably the the turning point. I, I ended up uh, getting a very very good pony, and uh, she was. She could do anything. She could pony race. She could hunt. She could show jump. She'd done the whole lot. Um, so I was very lucky to come across uh, a horse like her. And uh, then I just, from there on, I was kind of always obsessed with jockeys' colours, really. And um, um, I suppose uh, kind of, there was no very little racing televised in Ireland. So we were always watching uh, the English racing and the camera used used to drive alongside the race and, and you get such a great view and it was, things like that made me fall in love with the sport mostly but I, uh, then again I'd be very interested in the breeding side of it and really just being around horses um, from early on it wasn't as much to be a jockey it was it was just more or less being around horses and then we used to go point to pointing at the weekend and hunting and all them different things and we're lucky that the horse, our horse racing industry is uh like you could meet you could meet anybody out in the day's hunting or you could you could meet them at the sales or, or you know, at a point to point or anything. So um they're they're very open and obliging. So it was something that you'd like to take when I was a young lad that I'd like to give my time to the younger kids as well, you know, now that I've um been lucky enough to ride some winners. Yeah. Is it like you obviously grew up around horses? Is that common within jockeys? Like, is it is it rare to see a jockey make the top level that wasn't around, like that didn't grow up around them at a very early age? Yeah, no, there has been there has been um, definitely um, jockeys that have done like Johnny Murta, I suppose, would be the most high profile yeah. one. Um, um, but his stature probably helped him in that way. And uh, another chap who was he's not riding anymore, but uh, he was a very successful jockey was Keith Hadnett. I don't think he sat on a horse until he was fifteen or sixteen. Yeah. And uh, there is, there is definitely, there's, there's no. I suppose the beauty about horse racing is there's no set rules. You know, you can you can approach it whatever way you want. Um, but the one thing I suppose when you were, if you were going at it, you'd have to be fully committed to it. It's it, it kind of um, it absorbs everything, your time and everything that goes around you has to be fully committed to the sport and. 
unfortunately, if you're not, it's probably not that forgiving, you know? Yeah. And what age then would you have got your license at and really, you know, gone um, hard at this jockey? Right. It was it, it was just uh, so you you're not allowed to get your license until you're 16. Um, and back then it was pretty straightforward. You got your license and you could basically ride. And um, now I suppose the rules change a little bit and you have to they're a little bit more stringent. Mm. Um, but when I was 16, I got my license and and that was it. I didn't have to do any course. I, I just had to get references from trainers and go up and answer a few questions. And there you go. I had my license. So. Um, but it took me quite a number of years. I was 16 when I had my first ride, so it was just a horse that we had at home yeah. that he was right out before I went to school. And um, then I rode, she only ran once. And uh, I had a, another ride in a bumper that year, um, one ride in the bumper and no success. But obviously, you know, I loved it. And then I moved on to the year after and I got a couple of more rides, um, still no winner, and it took me kind of uh, it took me three full years before I actually had any success. Yeah. And then when I had it, when I had a winner, uh, it just started to snowball from there. Um, it was just winner after winner after winner. I was very lucky. Um, probably hit it at the right time. There might have been a gap in the market for for a young rider, and uh, I was I was able to fill it. Yeah, stuff. Uh, look, there's loads of different kind of areas of horse racing I want to touch on from a mental point of view. But I want to start off with the weight because that's just a really interesting one. You know, you think of weight governing sports, I suppose, the most common one you think of is boxing, I suppose. It, but a fighter probably only have two, three fights a year. They'll go through camp, they'll cut weight, weight on fight week, but then they can kind of balloon up again. Whereas jockeys, I suppose, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're almost living in a constant, like, a constant weight cut almost, like, so. Even just from a physical point of view, like are you on a constant calorie deficit pretty much year round? Yeah, um, I, I'm probably old school in a way that um, I, I got f- some terrible bad habits by the way I went about uh, losing weight. And unfortunately, just the way it is, I, I, I was unable to change from, from them habits and that's the way I do it. But um, it's probably the one downside to the sport, especially yeah. for me at 5'11 and... Yeah. and I I I struggled to be doing any sort of a weight really, so it's it's a constant roller coaster. Um, it's pretty much when I'm in the thick of it, I'm sweating every single day. Um, I have to mind what I what I eat every single day. Um, it's just one of them things. That's what happens when you get your license. There, it's one of the the downsides to it, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's pretty much. The physical side of it, I don't mind. Uh, I don't mind. My body is able to take it and it's used to it. But uh, the mental side of it is very, very difficult. I, I, I completely change. Um, my my um, temperament completely changes when I'm wasting, or when I was wasting hard. I don't waste as hard anymore um, mm. because it just doesn't suit me. I, I become a completely different person. I don't ride as well as I should. And, um, you know, I don't perform to the standard I should. I'm I'm kind of capable of, of performing there or what I'm, what's expected of me so um, I don't waste as hard as I used to I still have to be very very careful of what I do and um, so that is the one side of it so I, I'd actually take the injuries and the knocks and the bangs and the breaks if I didn't have to waste wasting yeah. it is the real torturous side of it and when I mean I mean torturous like it's it's pretty much 24-7 and even for the sake of I might not be hungry at 25 past 10 in the morning and when declarations are done, so when the, when the final declarations are done and I know what I'm writing at 25 to 11, I could just become hungry because of mm. if I do a lightweight, it's just whatever way it triggers, whatever it triggers in my mind. Yeah. Uh, if I look at the declarations, I see them down to do 10, 11 or 10, 10. I immediately, all I want to do is eat. Um, it's, 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 it's crazy. You're talking about waste in there. Can you tell us, like, what extent would you go to to get the weight off? Are you sitting in sweatsuits? Are you sitting in saunas? Like, what kind of extent would you go to? Yeah, I suppose every everybody's different. Um, I I'm not that well, not that keen. I I just don't I don't sweat very well in a sauna. So, a sauna is the last resort for me. So I constantly, what I do is I constantly um, just keep an eye on my weight, and pretty much every evening I'd have a hot bath. Um, and then if I need to lose more, I'd have another hot bath in the morning. Um, I suppose foolishly, I have put on sweatsuits 
on the way to the races and continually sweat until you get to the races and then have a shower and maybe lose the last pound or two at the races yeah. in the summer, you know. So um, um, the intake of food is minimal. Um, but I, I did, I was lucky enough, I, I, I had a very brief conversation with a, a dietitian, or, uh, sorry, apologies, uh, with a, a guy called Dan Davies. Uh, I met him through Sean O'Brien and um, the rugby player. So he basically told me that I was mad doing what I was doing and the simplicity of a boiled egg in the morning would just completely change my whole uh, regime. And look, I took it on board. I wouldn't be great. You know, we're up pretty early every morning and to get up another half an hour earlier than that for the sake of having a boiled egg or a breakfast, I, I, I didn't, I, I, I had more value in the half an hour in bed than I did in the food. Yeah. But then after speaking to Dan, I, I, I done it and, and I've continued to do it and it has made a huge difference in my life yeah. uh, completely. And for the sake of a boiled egg can take me the whole way until the day's racing is over. Mm. So um, I don't need, I don't have that constant craving. Um, the one thing I suppose I have a weakness for is, is is sugary drinks that I get so far in a day that I need some sort of a kick. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, that's where I get it from. But I know it's not ideal, but that's that's what I just have to do. And that's it. Yeah. Uh, oh, I can but, imagine I can imagine the psychological side of that. Like, we all know what it feels like to, to be hungry. We all probably get a bit narky. But when you're doing that, like, round the clock, I can imagine that it would affect your mood almost consistently, would it? Like, it, is there times, like, especially maybe in your earlier days, would there be times where you were just generally miserable almost around the clock because of this whole dieting thing? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, pretty much from when I wake up in the morning, if you told me that your shirt is black, I'd nearly disagree with you just for the sake of it. <laughs> uh, you know, so, um, and I don't know what it was. I couldn't control it. And um, it was just, I can only put it down to wasting, constantly wasting and, just um, eating away at you inside that. And then I suppose the real, the real killer is that guys that don't have to waste and they just, they just don't bother their backside. You know, they have all that in front of them. They don't know how easy they have it. And then they just don't bother, you know, that's the real killer, you know? Yeah. One thing linked to the, to the weight that I want to ask you about, it's just from the outside looking in, it looks like a really interesting dynamic is the weighing room because, you know, you're there, you're probably the bit weight drained or whatever. You're there with all these other jockeys that like, I'm sure you're probably good friends with quite a few of them, but then at the same time, they're also your competitors and you've probably got that pre-race anxiety. Again, just looking from the outside in, it just looks like a, a kind of a strange concoction of emotion almost that's going on in there. So, for people like myself that have never been in there, can you kind of paint a picture of what the weighing room is actually like? Uh, the weighing room is pretty much like, we'll say to put it, it's what happens in the race course doesn't shouldn't it 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 does occasionally um, creep into the weighing room, but very very seldom. Mm -hmm. So the weighing room is a, sanct a sanctuary of away from the track. So what happens on the track, you know, 99 times out of 100 stays on the track yeah. and very rarely comes into the weigh room. And you might often see maybe after pulling up after a race, a couple of lads might leave a couple of barks at each other and it kind of stays there. Uh, it rarely comes into the weigh room. And if it does, then it's probably the obligation of the people around you to stop it. And, 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 and you know, it's done. There's nothing can be done about it now and, and just forget about it and move on, yeah. you know. So um, if someone is persistently doing or getting on each other's nerves, you know, then, you know, it can boil over okay. But it's it's very, very rarely. Everybody respects each other and we're all through it. And I suppose there's little things when an, a young rider comes in and, and tries to be too cocky or something like that. He can be brought down to earth very fast. And... I'm not saying you know being bullied or anything like that, but you have to respect you have to respect the way room that it's for everyone and it nobody is up or nobody is bigger or smaller than each other in the way room. Mm. Okay, you can go out and beat each other on the track and that's fine, but once you step inside, then you you're just you 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 you're, you have a couple of people around you that you're very familiar with and you know 
it's very important that nobody gets too high or too low. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's very it's very interesting just because it's so different to other sports in that sense, isn't it? Like you're just so close to your competitors, but you're like I can imagine maybe you're kind of gene, like gene them up a bit as well because they're probably your friends as well. Has there, like would there ever be a bit of a uh, bit of trash talk or whatever going on in there, or would it generally be quite quite no. respectful? No, no, no trash talk. No, no, it does none of that. It just the the, the wearing is not big enough for that, yeah. and you're dealing with so many different characters in there. It's, it's just not, it wouldn't have the capacity to take that. Yeah. Um, if we were to trash talk to each other, that's fine if you went into a different room yeah. um, and people went into separate rooms, but you don't, we're all in the one room. There's okay. There's two different sets of valets, we'll say um, two different companies and one does one side of the wear room and the other does the other side of the wear room, but there's actually no split between either side with jockeys or anything like that. Um, and, it's just it just doesn't have the capacity to take that that kind of a uh, I think so. Everything once you step into the wear room, you pretty much leave everything from outside out there, and there's no room in, and it won't be it it just won't be tolerated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, won't be tolerated by the riders. And okay, it can be a tough place at times, but it is that for a reason. And I I, I would hate that anybody would feel um would feel that. Every every rider is welcome in the wear room, yeah. but you earn your position in there as well. And and there's rules, certain rules and ways that go back generations upon generations and decades and decades of riders, and that has to be respected. Yeah. So yeah. and 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 if it's if you lose that if you lose that then you lose the wear room, and if you lose the wear room, you have no hope. You know. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I, just, I, just, I always found that the the weight side of horse racing so just so interesting from a mental point of view. Another, another area that. Sorry, it's actually got tougher. The weight t- side has got tougher. So, so we'll say if I weigh out one fifty one, which is ten eleven, I have to return one fifty one. Do you understand? There's no, there's no room, there's no room for error. There's no room. Yeah. So when I weigh out, look before you, you had a little bit of leniency on the way back in. So if I weighed out one fifty one. I'd have to weigh, I could weigh back in 152, 153 maybe. So that you would get a drink or you get some bit of fuel into your body. Now that is not acceptable. You get fined, you get suspended. There's no room for error. So if you weigh out 151, you must return 151. So now, okay, if it's raining or there's mud flying or something and it's consistent across the board, that's fine. But if you don't have your weight under control, then you just can't take the ride. It's right, it's right in one way and it's hard in another way, but, you yeah. know, that's the rules. No, it just sounds, it sounds very intense. And even when you get injured, like you've been injured for the last couple of months, anyone that gets injured is going to put on a, a couple of pounds. Like, but even, even though you're basically not able to move, you had a bad neck injury, are you still kind of trying to keep on top of the weight as much as humanly possible? Yeah, you have to. You yeah. have to. Because uh, I've been... Uh, when you get to a, sundry, a certain point of weight, it is so difficult to get away yeah. from that. And you get into habits. Like, well, I do, and I'm, I, I'm a habit. The habits get on me very fast. And so um, I, I, I just have to watch it the whole time. Yeah. Well, another like area of horse racing that I'm interested in from a mental point of view is the preparation. Now, I'm not even talking about get, like actual race day preparation at the moment. I'm talking more in the week leading up to a race because, again, You'd almost need to be a proper student, would you? Wouldn't you? Because you'd need to nearly know what's going on with all the horses. You need to know what they're all like. Because if you're not going to be riding them, you're going to be competing against them. So, like, can you just talk us through your preparation on race week, not race day, just the actual lead up? Like, are you doing study at home? Is it absolutely all in? Yeah, uh, completely. I, I suppose I, I learned a lesson very early. I, I, I was riding in a race as an amateur, and I knew exactly the way the race was going to work out. I had it to a T. Hmm. I disregarded one horse and he nearly beat me and I promised I'd never I, I'd never not do my homework properly if you know what I mean yeah so that um now there's overdoing it and there's under so and there's getting it right um I, I suppose number one you need to know your own horses yeah so that's irrelevant to what anybody else is doing so you need to know your own and after that, then you need to know where the pace is coming from, what suits what suits your own horse, and how the race is going to be run to suit your horse. Yeah. 
And then the only way you'll, you'll know that is that if you're consistently watching racing, watching racing, watching racing, and uh, watching how different horses are and looking up form and, you know, just, just generally, as I said from the start, you have to be all in. Well, basically, what you've said there, you're talking about that all in mentality. Um, some, that's something I'm interested to talk to you about because recently for my own work I've had to do a lot of reading up about jockeys and like you know listening to different interviews reading different interviews reading different studies done on them and that's something that has been really clear it's come out quite a few times how jockeys view other jockeys who almost have outside interests as they view that almost as a weakness they're not fully all in that it just has to be it just has to be absolutely all in whereas I suppose thinking about it just as a more rounded individual you would think it would be good to have outside interests, maybe not to be so engrossed in the one thing, but would you say that there is a bit of room to change that, that maybe jockeys, there is a bit of room for them to get maybe outside interests or you just have to, it has to be just 110%? Yeah, well, I, I suppose it's, it, it's fine having outside interests as long as you put the work in to, you know, to when, you're, when you're concentrating on your racing... You know, it's fine if you want to do it casually. That's fine. You know, if you want to be a casual jockey, or but if you want to, you know, reach the very, very top. Yeah. It's pretty. There's basically not much room. There's not much yeah. room there for anything else. So would it be viewed as a weakness almost within the jockey? Um, I I wouldn't I I wouldn't worry about any other rider personally. I I would just worry about my own. I I I have enough to worry about my own. So I don't. It doesn't bother me what other riders do. That's that's entirely up to themselves, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's when I'm competing. You know, when I'm competing. Outside of that, you know, it's completely different. But but when I'm competing, I, I really don't care what. I I don't look for weaknesses or strengths in anybody else. I just kind of try and keep my own, work on my own stuff. Really, you know. Yeah, I'm actually just leading on from my last question because again, doing this research that I've been doing recently and reading up about you know different studies that's been done. Uh, another thing I came across is that actually statistically, jockeys work with sports psychologists far less than most other sports. And like you've you've spoken already about things like the the weight and things like that. So it it strikes me as a sport that you know maybe athletes could be working with sports psychologists maybe a bit more. But um, I have two parts to this question really. A, why do you think there's not, there doesn't seem to be much buy-in from jockeys in general to work with a sports psychologist. And B, have you yourself personally worked with a sports psychologist in the past? Yeah, so I suppose... For, I can only answer for myself. Yeah. So for me to work with a sports psychologist, I, I never really thought of it. Yeah. Um, I never really thought how... You know, don't get me wrong now, I know... I know there is room definitely there for sports psychologists in horse racing, but for me, I was just, I would always wonder how would a sports psychologist help me be a better rider? So um, there's other sides. I, I, I do speak to people outside of, of, you know, we'll say the circle, the trainer, the, the weighing room, I think that, you know, would have a good knowledge of racing. Yeah. And, you know, if I was, you know, a little bit worried about something. There's different people that I'm able to talk to, um, and in their own way, they are sports psychologists yeah, to me. Yeah, yeah. So, where you'd worry about it, you see, if you could find a sports psychologist that was an expert on jumping horses, jumping, and if you had an error, if you had a, a a thing in your in your mindset that you you, you the horses weren't just jumping for you or things weren't happening for you and you had a sports psychologist that had that background I'd say he could be very very busy he'd be a very very busy sports psychologist yeah. or if you had a sports psychologist that you know not so much that was fully dedicated to horse racing and yeah. could talk in the ins and outs and the ups and downs of of the actual sport the understanding of the sport yeah so and don't get me wrong what 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 a sports psychologist then can just work all them things, and he, he may never have be have to see have seen a horse because there's other aspects. I understand that, yeah. but I'm only just saying from my point of view. With me yeah. growing up a little bit older, so maybe now 
nowadays, yes, there is an awful lot more room there for sports psychologists and horse racing, but I'm of an older vintage. And again, it's just hard. I'd find it hard to get back, to break into it yeah. uh, and talk to someone about it. But I would definitely talk to people. Yeah. Um, don't not talk to people. I would talk to people about issues that I would have during races that I would respect their opinion. Yeah. That they would be able to watch a race and, and talk about it and be taking every race separately, you know? Yeah, because obviously jockeys don't necessarily have coaches, sure you don't. So it's just yourself and no. the horse and another trainer. So, like, who would you actually talk to? Would you just pick out other jockeys that you'd be close to, is it? No, yeah, no. Well, there is that side of it, yeah. Yeah, so it was so a couple of lads in the way room. Um, mm. If I felt I'd done something wrong or if it felt it didn't work for you, I'd say, Jesus, what do you think of that? And, mm. You know, but really, I, I I have friends outside of, they're not jockeys. Yeah, yeah. They, they, so they, they rode horses, but not to any great level, but they would be brilliant readers of a race and yeah. they would be able to see what's going on. Um, there's another man, he he wouldn't be a, a, a racing man, he's more show jumping. And and if I was having issues with horses just weren't jumping properly for me, I'd often give him a call and, and literally he talked me through it for... 30 seconds a minute and we're back in order, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and just it's speak- a, confidence, a confidence thing too. Do you know what I mean? It's it's, yeah. it's 99% confidence. Yeah. So just staying on sports psychologist for the moment, there's this jockey pathway now that they're after introducing. So for anyone listening that's not sure, essentially it's just, it's like a sports science, you know, like strength and conditioning, things like that, and sports psychology service that's provided for Irish jockeys. It's free of charge if you're a licensed Irish uh, jockey. Do you see something like that? Maybe improving like the relationship between jockeys and I know you said you're of an older vintage maybe maybe it wouldn't interest you personally but for the new up-and-coming crop of jockeys do you, do you think this could help them oh absolutely yeah I think it's a great initiative and again if sport if there if it's the same sports psychologist talking to jockeys yeah. regular then both the psychologist and the writers will be getting benefit from it. So it can only get better and better and better and better. And and this psychologist, him or herself, will be able to read situations an awful lot better. And, oh, definitely, if if it was back when I was a chap, I'm pretty sure that I would be using it now. Um, yeah. And it would be very strong in any young lad. Yeah to go and, and, and make use of that because it is a brilliant initiative. Yeah. Um, it's badly wanted, no oh, doubt. Yeah. Yeah, sure get, get, getting into the psychologist, knowing the sport, you know yeah. what I mean? Which, which is which is basically what we didn't have or what I what I didn't have growing up, you know? Yeah, sure, as I said, free of charge as well. I mean, yeah. if you're a licensed jockey, it's almost a case of why wouldn't, why wouldn't you at least give it a go? That's right, that's yeah. right. And they, they can only be getting better with time both yeah. the psychologists and everybody learning about it, you know? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I know you've kind of spoken about your preparation in terms of the week of a race, but I want to talk to you specifically now about the actual day of a race. So how would you be, you know, before a race? Is there nerve? Because obviously you've got the nerves and the nerves and anxiety and things like that. Like over the course of your career, like have you had to learn ways to sort of control your pre-race emotions or were you always a pretty chilled out kind of a fella that could do it naturally? Um. I suppose, well, I suppose our preparations, um, I, I tell you where, where, where I get anxious. The only time I, I, anxious, I, I get anxious is that, sorry, so um, the only time that I, I would get anxious or anything like that is that, so it starts the day before, or as you said, it starts during the week, so you have a rough idea of what you're going to ride, where your weight is going to be. So the day before declarations are run, or now it's actually two days beforehand, so you have that... Um, in your locker, so you ha- I have to uh, I-, I have to have my weight organised. Uh, timing is is very important, so that if I'm riding out that morning, that I need to be at the races at a certain time. Yeah. I need everything has to has to go according to plan. So you're driving to the races. You have to it takes so long to get there. You have to allow a little bit extra if there's a, a stoppage on the road or something like that. So and when you land at the races, that will say I don't have too much weight to lose. Um, I can go out and assess the ground. Um, I can check where the non-runners, if there's non-runners, um, if any of mine aren't running, if there's any changes there. Um, 
And it's all about having enough time, be there in time, be early enough and be prepared that there's no little glitch in between that you haven't given yourself enough time that you don't panic. That's the only time that, that, that I get, um, that I get anxious is when if something goes wrong earlier on in the morning and I'm set back and I'm back and I'm back. If I arrive at the races late, if I don't give myself enough time to prepare, if I arrive, the race is heavier than I would have anticipated being there. And I have to spend longer in the sauna, little yeah. things like that. But, other than them, I tried to keep all of them under control. And I saw that's why I start the day before. So a, a day's racing starts the day before for me. And even like you obviously race in the biggest, you know, biggest races in the world, whether it's, let's just say a grand national, like a massive race. If you're racing that, would it be the exact same? Like so long as you're hitting all your pre-race sort of rituals, would you not feel any, any heightened anxiety? Would you just feel pretty much the same so long as you've ticked those boxes? Yeah, exactly. I, I, I find for some reason the bigger the day, the easier it is for me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I love the big days. Um, the more money people have on a horse that I ride, the more confident I get. Um, I love it. I love, I, I really love riding under pressure or, or not whatever you call, want to call it. But mm. I, 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 I love riding for, for Gordon Elliott, he's a high-profile trainer. He's got high-profile yeah. heart. Um, but again, you see, it's it, my job is much easier because you're riding for such good trainers. Yeah, you know, and the more them horses are fancied, the better I, the more I enjoy it. So you you don't feel any extra pressure if you're riding a red hot favorite. You don't feel any extra pressure on that one, though. No, I, less I, even. I I just it's none of my money. I don't really care. You know, I I, I just. Um, I don't, um, I, I just love to be able to perform, love whether, I love that it's a popular winner, if you know what I mean, like, you know what I mean, and it's more, I'm a, <clears throat> I'm a little bit selfish is in that I would love the limelight. Yeah. Yeah. No, I get yeah. So yeah. you've, you've, you've spoken a bit there about kind of controlling the emotions before a race. Can a horse pick up on the jockey's emotions, do you think? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, you can find that out through from all my my life as a, as a young lad when you're riding ponies and things, um, and I see it with my own kids if they get a little bit upset on the pony, the pony will take full advantage. So that continues the whole way through to when you're riding. You know, if you're upset getting up on a horse, or if you have to get in a bollock in the race beforehand, and mm. and you're upset getting up on a horse, and nothing will go to plan. A horse will, you know, the smallest little things will upset you, whereas. You know, if you're nice and relaxed and you've, you you have not the worry in the world, them things just don't seem to happen, you know? Yeah. Just linked to kind of horses getting a bit uneasy before race. This is, if this isn't true, it'll be the most stupid question I've ever asked, but I'll ask you anyway. Is it true that goats calm down horses and that it's not completely uncommon for a goat to maybe be at a, ra a race course every now and then? Or is that just not true at all? No, I've never, I've never, ever heard that. Definitely. Never heard that one, no? <laughs> no, I'm only joking. I'm joking. It is. <laughs> It is very true. There's certain horses. Um, there's one horse in particular at, at the moment called Mona Lee. Uh, he's a very high profile horse. He's very, very good. And everywhere he goes, the goat goes with him. That's so, mad. Yeah, the goat lives in the stable with him. Uh, he travels to the races with him. The goat has to have his own passport and vaccinations and everything up to date so that he can travel with the horse. And the horse is very an ordinary horse with the goat and gets very, very upset without him. That's absolutely nuts, isn't it? It's like the goat is yeah. a sports psychologist for the horse. It's yeah. Crazy. Even when the horse goes for a pick of the grass, a pick, a pick of grass in the evening time, the goat will go with him. And that's in the, that the goat travels to Cheltenham with him and, and wherever he goes, the goat travels with him. Yeah. <laughs> and then they can take a dislike to him as well. Um, yeah. Brilliant, yeah. isn't it? Um, yeah. So obviously, after a race, then you've won or you've lost. Like sometimes, win, sometimes winning and losing is a it's a fairly uh, it's like a weak evaluation really of success because I know an awful lot of jockeys will get right very few winners really throughout their career. So if you're evaluating your success based purely off winning or losing, you'd be probably disappointed quite not quite a lot as a jockey. So as a jockey, like do you have to reevaluate what success is like? So after a race, when you're evaluating your performance, 
is it more than just winning and losing? Because if you're riding a red hot favourite, for for example, it might be a case of just keeping him in between the ditches and he'll he'll take it from there. Well, you could be riding an absolute outsider and you could win or you could get placed. And, you know, that's a great performance by you. So more so than in other sports, in horse racing, do you need to sort of reevaluate what success is rather than just winning and losing? You, you've, you've actually hit the nail on the head. Uh, like, really spot on. So... We'll say where I get a lot of uh, um, um, feel good from is exactly what you said, is riding a horse that is regarded as no hoper and getting them to run well. Or you often ride horses that a fella says, look, he hasn't jumped well in his past two or three occasions. You know, we'd really just love a good round of jumping. Yeah, yeah. And if it happens, that's a success. You know, that is, is a victory in a way. Um, and really, at the end of the, day, of the day, you'll only ever be... be um, you'll only ever be... What, uh, the winners are the, uh, what, what counts and what's written down in black and white. But through your career, to make the owners and trainers happy, you have to have all these other victories as in being capable of getting a horse to jump well, being capable of getting a horse that is not renowned for having a f- strong finish to get him to finish a race and run well. And there's so many different things. Getting a horse even to settle, you know, that he's ran free his past two or three runs and all of a sudden you can, you can get him to settle in a race or vice versa. A horse just won't carry a rider and all of a sudden you get on him and you can get that little bit more out of, out of them. Yeah. All of them are, are, are victories and, you know, okay, they're not numbers on the, on the sheet that when you retire you've ridden so many winners, but throughout your career to try and keep everybody happy, and to continue being a jockey, you must have all these other victories, if you know, as you well pointed out, that you're capable of getting a horse 33 to 1 to finish second in a race that maybe he shouldn't have finished second in, finished yeah. third, fourth. You know, you're collecting prize money the whole time. The owners are happy, the trainer is happy. There's light at the end of the tunnel for another day. And maybe that other day, you might get a victory out of them. Mm. You know, and so. All them small victories are definitely, definitely a plus. Yeah. Yeah. How would you analyze the performance then? Like, because obviously you put so much preparation into a race, but in the aftermath, then, like, do you go, do you watch the take back? Do you talk to whoever about, like, another jockey or whatever about it, the trainer maybe? Yeah, I do. I do. I watch replays. Uh, not so much anymore. I'd rather watch races that I didn't win than watch races that I did win, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what I could have done differently yeah. I, might, I, may, I may not have done anything wrong yeah. but I still if I didn't win the race I would like to find out a way that I could have won the race yeah. you know what I mean so I wouldn't be blaming myself every time I would be quite quite, quite critical of myself but um, you always have to find the reason why you didn't win and, and try and make them win you know yeah. no I, I get you yeah. so Let's just say you didn't win. I'm, I'm kind of interested. I'm going to change gear here, but I'm interested to know about the social media side of things because, you know, footballers, for example, get dogs abuse on Twitter and things like that. Now, I know you're a, a Twitter fan yourself. You seem to use it quite a bit. If, if, if you didn't race well, like, would, would jockeys come in for a bit of stick online or is that not really something you experience? Oh, huge, huge, huge stick, yeah. yeah. Yeah, huge. But I'm just lucky. I'm big enough and bold enough now to press the block button and, and, and delete it out of my mind. I, I'm not on Twitter for people to fire abuse at me. I, yeah. I, I'm, re- I'm on Twitter for a bit of crack. Yeah. Uh, I enjoy the, the, the funny side of it. Um, there is other aspects of it that, that with, with, with advertisement and all that, that needs to be, that needs to be, that, that are huge pluses. Yeah. But if a fella wants to come on and start shouting abuse at me on Twitter, I'm not, he can do that in his own time, but it's not going to be in mine, you know? Yeah, rightfully, rightfully so as well, yeah. Um, well, I wouldn't know, if a fella was doing it to me walking down the street, I'd tell him to where, where to go. So, you know, it's, it's the same, it's the same thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, I get you. Yeah. So, 
basically after after everything you've achieved because you've achieved so much in in the game and obviously you know just coming back off a bad injury you've had now I think you're you're 40, 40 or forty one now is it yeah forty one yeah forty one so like after all you've achieved what would you say the the motivation is for you now because you've kind of you've kind of completed the game you've 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 done it all really so at this stage what would the motivation be ah uh, sure you never do it all um um there's never you, you I haven't won every race that I've ever competed in um I, like to be very successful it's it's a bit of a drug I, I love coming yeah. into the winner's enclosure I, I'm not ready to give up that drug yet um, so um, I just I, I, I just love being a jockey there's, there's, there's nothing else in my opinion I think we have the best sport in the world um, again I suppose hurling and football probably run very close to it for me and the passion that's involved in it um we don't get a whole load of money compared to what we put into it. Uh, we're badly paid on that side of it, but at the same time, you can earn a living and a very nice living, and it's a great way of life. So I, I, I'm not complaining, but what I what I am saying is that I, I really feel that we probably have one of the greatest sports in the world, and and Ireland are leaders in that sport. So it makes me very, very proud to be part of it. And I'm very happy to continue it for as long as I can. And then I would, I, I, I'll go down a different route, but I just, I just love being in the sport that our country are out so far ahead of yeah. the rest. And, um, you know, it's just, and, 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 and the, 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 the supporters that we have that watch racing and hopefully even with this lockdown that we may get, gain more supporters but they are the best in the world they really really are there's some fantastic people out there that, that love our sport and really really enjoy it and take it for what it is and you know so it's, it's I'm very proud to be, to be still at it you know yeah so you know you're so all in with it you love it you spoke there about the, the drug you're not willing to give up yet when the day comes that you do retirement or do retire, sorry, would you fear retirement in any way? Because I know some jockeys probably struggle a bit with that transition into retirement, into maybe a new career or other interests because they just spent so much of their lives completely invested. Like, is it something you would worry about? No, not worry. No, I, I, I hopefully I'd have that covered, but when, for when that time comes. So yeah. Hopefully, yeah. yeah. What would the plan be? Would you like want to stay involved in racing in some capacity? Yeah. Oh, definitely, yeah. yeah, definitely, definitely. I, I, I would f- find it. I would, I would f- find it very hard just to walk away. I, I really would find it hard to just walk. Yeah, that's good stuff. Look, there's two questions, David, that I finish asking everyone. So the first one is, uh, what athlete in the history of sport, and it could be from any sport at all, would you admire most from a mentality point of view, and why? Jesus. Um. I, 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 we, we go on go on to the next next one right the, the last one then is uh, when I'm, uh, we'll come back to it yeah I'll come back to that one so the last one then is if you were to go back and talk to yourself when you were let's just say when you were starting off racing and give that younger version of yourself a uh, you know a little bit of advice again from a mental point of view what would you say to that younger version of yourself I, I just lost you there sorry uh, Anthony you, sorry I was just saying if you were to talk to a younger version of yourself let's just say the your younger self that's only starting out in racing and you were to give him one piece of advice from a mental point of view as well what bit of advice would you give him oh I, I definitely try and enjoy it more yeah. Yeah. Um, I would definitely try and enjoy enjoy it more from a, from a younger age yeah well I really enjoyed the younger years and when the weight got involved because I was an amateur first and when the weight got involved that took the the, the, the happiness out of it but now I'm back enjoying it the way I used to enjoy it at the start so it's, it's hard I, I, I probably tell myself to go on a proper diet and enjoy <laughs> yeah. it maybe not wait hard yeah. yeah before I let you go have you thought of that uh, that athlete that you admire most um, um Jesus um I should have prepped you for this one before we started shouldn't I it's not fair really yeah. to be springing it on you I, I, I suppose the one the one the one person probably st- st- stands out at the moment is Patrick Horgan um, I, I just think that <laughs> I just think he's so talented um, he, he, he's a master of his trade um, he's from one of the greatest hurling counties that we have 
and he still hasn't got an All Ireland medal. Um, and for me, for him to keep getting the hunger to come back and back and back and back, I just, I just think I, I, I really, really love Patrick Horgan. I think he's, a, he's, I think he's just so talented. Um, I think the amount of pressure that's on him, he's a free taker. I think you know, it, and and still hasn't just hit the go- holy grail. Yes, but I think it's still, I, I, you know, it's 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 it, it's only an arm's reach away from him, you know. So that's good stuff. Look, Dave, it was brilliant hearing all about you. I haven't had a jockey on the podcast yet, so I did want to find out about the mental side of of horse racing. So it was brilliant to hear hear all about it. So thanks very much for coming on to the podcast. Thanks very much, Andy. Cheers. Big thanks this week to Davy Russell for coming on to the podcast. I've wanted to have a jockey on for quite a while now because I think it's a it's one of those sports where you know I don't think there's probably enough known about how difficult it is to be a jockey. You know the mental side of the game. You could imagine could be quite brutal at times. You know in terms of different factors like the weight that Davy spoke about there, how absolutely all in and invested you have to be. Like it's a full on lifestyle rather than just a, a career. So to hear Davy talk about different elements of the mental side of being a jockey was absolutely brilliant so obviously he's one of Ireland's top top jockeys ever as well so to have a jockey of that caliber on to talk about his experience was absolutely brilliant so thanks a million for that Davy, and thanks everyone for watching i'll see you next week with a new athlete thanks